from Trident Hospitality who have a wealth of experience, contacts, knowledge, all of which they're going to impart with us today. No pressure. Thank you, Claire. Well, well welcome on and all those that we know, those that we don't know. Um, right. The, the title we chose today is What Have Sales Ever Done For Us? So uh, it's not original. It's very much stolen, lifted, depending on who's suing you, from the famous line from the brilliant Monty Python film, The Life of Brian. Now, they asked, actually asked what the Romans had ever done for them. And one of the subjects under occupation asked, uh, what have the Romans ever done for us? He then smugly sits down, not expecting any answers, as he wrongly believed that there was no actual positives to the situation. Nobody, nobody thought the, the Romans had done anything for them. However, over the next couple of minutes, the crowd began to shout out a multitude of real benefits, including the food, the wine, safety at night, roads, refuse collection, and so on and so on. The point being that many people who've not worked in sales and maybe just in operations, many of us have been through both uh, operations and sales, think that uh, salespeople just sit around, make the odd phone call and drink coffee. Well, that's not true because I drink tea. But oh dear. Yeah, <laughs> not during the day. But uh, obviously we're very much still in the middle of the COVID situation, which has been pretty dreadful for, for everybody. Uh, we've all been in various recessions over the years and also many downturns. But the current situation, to uh, use the, co the current common term, is, is, is very unprecedented, to use one uh, cliche. That, um, so as the economy hopefully picks up in the future, or even during these early days when the, the roadmap from Boris is, is, is released, the need to get business into our business is absolutely paramount. And we all know that some of our regular clients will return, hopefully, but some won't. So there will be many old contacts that we can renew, but unfortunately, as we all know, there will be quite a few people not actually working in these uh, the corporates, agents, uh, businesses anymore, unfortunately. Therefore, it is absolutely imperative, as we all realise, the need to increase the pipeline of business and work on new contacts. And it's, it's probably more important than it ever has been, to be honest, certainly in our business. So how do we do this? Well, it's easy by saying, well, being proactive with ourselves. Well, well what is proactivity? Well, We'll obviously mention that in the course of the next 10, 15 minutes. But venues need to be out there physically whenever possible, meeting clients and agents, and also looking at how they can bring in new sources of business from maybe untapped markets. So if we need a fully functioning, well-trained sales team, why are so many salespeople being let go by venues? I'm sure you've seen LinkedIn, some fantastic people are looking for work have been lost. Or well, maybe we know the reasons because there's been no cash flow, there's been no money coming in. But who's, who's going to be out there getting in touch with, with the contacts from corporates, from agencies, if these sales teams have been disbanded and there's nobody there? What have salespeople ever done for us? If there's nobody out there working on your behalf as a venue, you'll soon find out. Your venue might be COVID ready, absolutely safe, but ultimately pretty empty. Anyway, Kevin, would you like to pick up from there? Absolutely. And uh, we know the dreaded date last year in March where everything disappeared down the toilet uh, for many of our businesses. Uh, but, but let's look back to what, um, what the business was worth to, to the economy. And this has been pulled together from various publications, conference news and comments from our associations, the HBA, AMIA, et cetera, et cetera. But the, 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 the values of our business, of, of our industry has gone from anything from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 billion to 85 billion. But I think what we need to bear in mind is that we're such a disparate type of industry. We've got venues, you know, we've got agents, we've got events, and we've got all of the infrastructure behind that. So security, show force who are building sets and whatever, caterers, wedding venues, wedding caterers, et cetera, et cetera. How many people did it employ in the UK before it all went south? Uh, Martin's already alluded to the fact that quite a few of our colleagues and friends are no longer in, in roles that they were. Uh, but it, it sort of varies from half a million up to 750,000 people, dependent on what you're, where you're looking at it from. Uh, but I did read somewhere this week that there is it is thought that a third of the population has some involvement or had some involvement in the hospitality industry before the, the pandemic took hold. And that's going down right the way down to 
people who do part-time in bars and part-time restaurant shifts, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the plan going forward? How do we future-proof our industry? I think basically we need to look at our, our um, the way we work. We have to look at our teams. We have to make sure our teams are lean, hungry, and ready to, to move forward. But more of that as we go on. So back to you, Martin. Uh, thanks, Kev. Yeah, onwards and upwards. Well, you know, the unfortunate situation, because of we all know from Boris and the government uh, and their uh, reluctance to let hospitality get cracking, even though I think it was 3% of cases apparently were, were related to the hospitality industry for COVID, which is incredibly small. So some venues are still closed and they have been for a year. So it's, it's very easy for venues to sort of fall off the radar. You know, so people will have forgotten the venue. So it's our job in sales to get out there and remind people that the venues, even though they're physically closed, they're actually open for business. So please make inquiries, phone, uh, send emails. I mean, Claire's had a, a with um, Venue Queen, noticed inquiries have started to come through. Lots of the agents we deal with have said, you know, it's gone mad this week, also last week. So be prepared to reply to, to uh, agents on behalf of their corporates. Because if you're not open, they'll go somewhere else. Just make a response, even if it's within 24 hours. So that makes a difference. Looking at the short term, I mean, we've got the rest of this spring and summertime. Uh, again, with Borrow My Garden, lots of clients are looking at doing stuff outside because by the very nature, it's probably healthier than being inside, even with their circulation and windows and all that kind of thing. So short term, what can we do? It's thinking out the box. Well, we've always done this in these meeting rooms. We've never opened our gardens. There's lots of venues now utilising gardens for, for various different business activities, as, as Carol will know extremely well with, with her company. So... So look at the short term, but obviously next year, and a lot of venues will say, well, we're busy because so much of the business has been put, put back until 2022, but there's now inquiries coming in for 2023. So, so what can we actually do? So it's very much a case of it's half glass full, not we don't even have a glass to, to take a drink out of. So it's, it's trying to be positive. It, it is tough, but you've got to think positively. What can we do? How can we do that? Communicate with buyers, communicate with agents. And really, you know, let's move forward. So what does this future look like? Well, Kev's going to tell us, unless it gets cut off. <laughs> By the co-host. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's that blue supporter, John, you know. Anyway, <laughs> moving forward, the, the, whole, the whole landscape of the meetings and events industry has changed. Uh, and within a business, you know, you need to know exactly what you have to sell. It's not going to be a case of you can sell uh, X number of meeting rooms and you can have uh, that room for a syndicate room, that for a meeting room, that for a, an auditorium, because it's everything's going to be different. You know, um, what's your online, you know, your online presence, that's your shop window. So your online presence, you need to make sure that it's up to date. One of the one of the criticisms that we've heard quite a lot of late is that with a lot of venues, they have they've paid an absolute fortune to be on the likes of venue directory. They've paid a fortune to be on search for venues and all that sort of thing. But actually, all they've done is regurgitated their brochure, which they had printed three years ago. So a meeting room that looks now to say, take 500 people, actually with social distancing, et cetera, can only take 150 people. You need to be honest upfront and make people aware of what you've got. Not mine. Other medication. <laughs> the other thing that you need to do as far as your, your venue is concerned is look at what you do have to offer and are you on the right platforms? The likes of, um, you know, we work with Maddingley Hall in Cambridge, which has got a huge amount of um, outdoor space and gardens, which traditionally they haven't used in the past but now they're using them and they've signed up to Borrow My Garden, which is a platform that is aimed purely and simply at people that are looking for outdoor spaces for meetings and events. If your venue is a bit left field, a bit odd, unique, however you want to describe it, then perhaps you should be looking to talk to Dan at uh, Prestige Events and their cool venue um, directory. There's all sorts of things that you need to be considering. Hybrid events. Uh, we've all heard a lot about hybrid events and there's been a, a, a lack of understanding. And in some cases, I think um, <clears throat> uh, 
people have been unwilling to 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 get to grips with it but the long and the short of it is that as we start coming out of this and people start saying well you can only have meetings for 15 20 30 whatever the re the uh, the restrictions are hybrid events will work the other thing with hybrid events is it works towards sustainability do you really want 400 people on a train making their way down to london in close proximity when you could have 20 people in London, 50 people in Birmingham, and all linked in by the new platforms. But it's this stage that you need to start looking at collaborations and working with organizations that can have, offer a platform, but you also need to understand those platforms so that you can communicate that to the likes of your agents, your, your existing client base. As I may mentioned before, the whole landscape of the meetings and events industry is, has changed. We need to look at, uh, we're gonna get new buyers now. New buyers will have different uh, priorities. Um, so they'll be looking at things, things that weren't perhaps as important, but things that we've started to recognize during the last 12 to 18 months is the importance of sustainability, looking after the planet. Um, if you have within your within your business, you have strong, sustainable policies and procedures, how are you making the market aware of that? You know, and it comes back to what I'm saying about online uh, platforms. You need to talk to people like Green Gage, who, funnily enough, Andrew is following on from Martin and myself, and I'm sure he will tell you how he can support businesses that are um, sustainable and working towards sustainability. If you see that as a key, key element of your business going forward, then perhaps you should talk to Green Gage because they can support you in making sure that you're working towards carbon neutral, that you're doing little, um, nothing going through to landfill, all of this sort of thing. But the other thing that's important is mental health and well-being, And the new buyers will be looking at what you can offer from that perspective. Um, we were talking to one venue recently that um, they, as a result of talking to a buyer, they've now set up what they call a reset and reboot room. And basically, if an organiser feels that a member of the, the audience that they're working with or, or one of their delegates is needing some time because they're getting basically uh, upset and can't cope with this new this new experience of meeting with lots of other people, then they can go off to this room, they can relax, they can reboot, they can think about things and then come back. It's all of these things are now quite important with the buyers that are coming through. And you need to look at new markets as well. And we've spoken about outdoor, outdoor spaces, unique venues, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, it's all about collaboration and getting involved and yep, from here on in, I'm going to hand you back to my partner in crime, Martin. Thanks, Kev. Yeah, it, it's very much about collaborations. It's a, it's a whole new world, literally, with who we're dealing with. And, you know, the business isn't going to come rolling in necessarily as it did before. Uh, Kevin and I met in 1990 at Peter Rand, which was the first ever conference agency going back, you know, just after the war, which is a long time ago. So the importance of third parties, a lot of venues have said to us, well, we don't want to pay commission because we get the, the business directly. Well, that's fine. But I think moving forward, we've got to be very aggressive in, in getting business. And we're certainly in contact with hundreds and hundreds of different agencies. Some have struggled, some might not come back in quite the same form, the same numbers, but they're extremely important. And a lot of venues say to us, well, we just want to get straight to the corporates, you know, the top, top 100 companies, et cetera. Well, A, it's got to be the right kind of business for your venue, and B, it's got to obviously make some money. So the thing is with agents, they've, they've been hit very hard and they're now opening up again, getting inquiries, but they're hungry. And the thing is they've worked extremely hard to develop clients. And whereas you might get into one, maybe two, if you speak to an agency, you might be getting into 10, 50, 100 potential uh, corporate buyers for your specific venue. So it's all about trying to work smart and you know, making, making some quick wins. So I think with, with agents, it's, it's a no brainer really. And, and Kevin and I, if, if the agents don't know Kev, they're, they're hardly not worth knowing because he knows everybody backwards. Yeah, it's so, all. <laughs> so with the agents, it's extremely important. It's working together, it's communicating and being adult about commission paid and the best rates. 
agents don't always want to screw you down to the lowest rate because then it lowers commission. It's always about it's about value for money, very much so. But hopefully they will return and it's 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 you know selling your venue in the best the best light. Uh, so so really the thing is it's working together. Who can you work with? Who can you trust? And moving forward in a slightly different way, and also utilizing experts, uh, which I think Kev, you're going to yeah talk about the other thing that. Um, it, has uh, become apparent is that a lot of businesses now are leaner. They don't have the uh, the resources that they had perhaps 12 months, 18 months ago because of, uh, of COVID and making people redundant, furlough, et cetera, et cetera, which in turn means that they, their pot to recruit experts in sales or experts in marketing or experts in social media and AV, they're just not there. So what we would say, we've, we've mentioned collaboration already, but there are a number of organization, organizations out there that you can buy, rather than paying a, a huge amount, and we're all worth it, for experienced salespeople, go to organizations, may I add, like Trident, that can help you get in front of agents, go to organize, marketing organizations like Borough My Garden that can put you in front of people who are buying uh, sort of outdoor spaces and go to and rather than investing and taking people into your team on a full-time basis work with organizations like us absolutely we're very oh, nice goodness. really the jokes aren't oh, we're, good but we're, 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 we're lovely <laughs> so in conclusion are things out of control out of our control absolutely not our future is down to us, not to anyone else. It, you can't sit on your backside and think, oh, it'll all come back in at some stage. It won't. You have to be pragmatic. You have to look at new approaches. You have to be flexible and fluid. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always had, I think is the saying. But to move forward, rebuild your business, you have to be flexible. You have to look at what you can do. And if somebody says, can you do this? And in the past, you can say, oh, no, don't do that. Uh, then you're not going to get anywhere. A point in case is one of our venue partners. If you'd have spoken to them 18 months ago, they would only do training courses and they would only do small corporate businesses. But as a result of COVID, they've been selling outdoor spaces. They've never, in 50 years of being in business, they've never ever done a wedding. For the next two years, they've got 80 confirmed weddings on the books. And that, how does that help them? People pay a deposit, they've got money coming in and they can survive. And it means that they can keep the team on, keep us on, ha. And, and you know, it's that, it's adapt or die, or as the government keeps saying, pivot and prosper, which is really quite difficult to say when you've had a strong cup of tea. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it from Martin and myself. And uh, there you are. You might be a pawn now, but work hard work with collaborate work with people and you'll end up a king uh, and i'm shortly going to hand you over to our colleague andrew from green gauge solutions we've been working quite closely with andrew uh, on sustainability and i think we all have a moral obligation both personally and from a business perspective to seriously consider the impact that we have not just on the environment but also on people that work for us from, so with mental health and wellbeing, and also for the local community. And on that note, I'm before, going to stop sharing my screen and hand you go, over. Yeah, oh. before we go to Andrew, has, have people got any questions for, um, for a couple of old folks like us? You know, what, what we could do to help, what's happening, thoughts, or if you've got any input, you know, obviously we're learning all the time. We, we certainly, pretend that we don't know everything and mm. this is a bit of an unknown future so you know it's as we said it's collaboration working with people and new ideas can be the, the way forward you know no I, I, you know one of the one of the organizations that we work with is um is carol at uh, forest of hearts and that you know that that's a way of working with the you know getting corporates to do something for a community whether it's their own community or working with a community uh, like carol does in in warwickshire and and around stratford but i'm sure if anyone's interested in forest of hearts if you get in touch with martin myself or or, 
or Claire, then we can get the information across to you. Sorry, I think I just saw a question from uh, come up there. Oh, thank you, Gillian. <laughs> questions. I think everyone's just endorsing the two of you. I know. Lovely. I could put one quick question in, if that's all right. Just have a second. No more time, Julian. It's going to be too complicated. <laughs> and, and thank you. And mute. <laughs> <laughs> it's just me that gets muted and taken off. <laughs> no, it, was, it was only just about whether whether the view is, whether there's a view on agents and commissions and whether, whether agents whether agents might take a view on commissions at the moment in, in order to try and help or whether perhaps reasonably from their side they're saying look we suffered as well mm. so so you know from the agency perspective those commission rates that we had are relevant and we need to charge them and i could see an argument both ways i just wondered if, if there was a feel on that um shall i take that martin Come on, yeah, I, it, it's interesting that um, just prior to the pandemic, I think it was Hilton was saying that they were going to stop paying commission to agents in the US. And then Marriott said that they were going on, they were going to do the same. Uh, and it was all of the, the, the American based groups that were going that route. Um, but then, but that's all sort of, but that's raised its head in the past. And I think Andrew probably knows better than I do that some of the um, some of the airlines were trying to cut that cut their commissions quite a lot in the '90s, early 2000s. Uh, but moving forward, I think it's all about working together with agents, and if you collaborate to get the right solution for the agent's clients, it works wonders. And the only way I, I think commission going forward has got has got to be the route. If if they're offering a free service, and I know some ag some agents do charge, but I think if if we can support the agent, if venues can support the agents by paying them commission, then they will support the venues. One of the things that has come out of the um, the, the pandemic from people that we've spoken to is that the agents are very keen to work alongside venues because they need those venues for their clients. And if they, if, if, if they start to hack us off or we start to hack them off, then we don't get the business. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the customer that's, that, um, that suffers in the end. So yes, I think commission will continue. And I think it's all down to collaboration. Claire's sitting there nodding her head. I suppose from an agent's perspective, we ought to ask your, your view, Claire. Yeah, and you know, it's really helpful having a venue background as well. And I have always taken the position that 10% of something is better than 0% of nothing. Therefore, mm. it's a no brainer. Mm. Absolute well, no brainer. Yeah. So it's ultimately a cost of sale as well, isn't it? If, if you rely mm. on agencies, well, then they're, they're getting in front of, as we said, 50, 100 corporates for you. And if, again, it comes down to communication and talking to someone and explaining, this is what you've got. And it might not be suitable for that particular inquiry. Nobody likes to say no, but ultimately, long term, if you're giving out correct information and liaising and communicating properly, then that agent will trust you and come back and say, "Well, this one we really think would work," or mm -hmm. you know, you looked after us last time. It's it's about it's about you know getting people in and, and trusting them and trying again mm -hmm. trying trying to have that business conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we sorry, I, I'm not trying to cut you short, but I know that uh, Andrew is ready and waiting and. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, your affordable sales team has a uh, YouTube, as does Trident has a YouTube. And moving forward, a lot of people, like from a Trident perspective, we are hoping to have uh, interviews with agents to get their perspective. So please keep an eye out for that. We're also talking to the venues and interviewing the venues. Andrew is going to be interviewed so we can talk about sustainability in the meetings and events industry. 